want to share something with you that has impacted my life in ministry, and it's changed my perspective. And my prayer today is that it will change yours as well and help push you into the destiny that God has on your life. And as we're in this legacy season and as we grow in it and are reminded or even taught what God wants to do through us, my hope is that you will embrace your part in this journey. You see, legacy is something that is our responsibility to uphold. It's our responsibility. The idea of legacy is to expand our thinking beyond ourself, to expand our thinking of just even the here and the now. And there's a story in the Bible that I was reminded of in a season of my life where God spoke to me and I was asking God for something and it was in this story that, I, that we're gonna read today that my eyes were opened, that I was able to see something that I haven't seen before. And, and what I was asking for, what I was praying for, what I was believing for God to do, I didn't realize but he had already given me, but there was a part that I had to play in it. And it was revealed to me in Joshua chapter 17, and we're gonna read this passage today, so if you have your Bible with you, turn to Joshua 17, and why don't you stand to your feet in honor of God's word today as we read it. Joshua 17. We're gonna read four verses today, verses 14 through 18. If you don't have your Bibles, you can look on the big old screen behind me. If you can't see that, go get your eyes checked this week. (laughs) Joshua 17, verse 14, it says this. The people of Joseph said to Joshua, why have you only given us one allotment and one portion for an inheritance? We are a numerous people and the Lord has blessed us abundantly. If you are so numerous, Joshua answered, and if the hill country of Ephraim is too small for you, then go up into the forest and clear land for yourselves there in the land of the Perizzites and the Raphites. The people of Joseph replied, the hill country is not enough for us. And the Canaanites who live in the plain have chariots fitted with iron, both those in Beth Shan and the settlements and those in the valley of Jezreel. Verse 17, but Joshua said to the tribes of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, You are numerous and very powerful. You will have not only one allotment, but the hill forested country as well. Clear it, and its farthest limits will be yours. Though the Canaanites have chariots fitted with iron, and though they are strong, you can drive them out. I want you to tell the title to your neighbor today very strongly. Clear your land. Tell them, clear your land. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for what you're going to do in our hearts today. God, I ask that you would speak to us in the hidden places of our life that maybe we've yet to hand over to you. God, I ask as we read this story and we understand more about who you are, I pray that you would reveal to us the, the purpose and the plan that you have for our life, that you would reveal to us our responsibility as Christians and as believers, as the body of Christ, what you want to do through us. So God, touch us today. Speak to us. We come with open hearts and open minds. Restore us today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Well, have you ever had a time in your life where, as a parent maybe, or as a friend that you gave your kid or someone, a family or a friend, something that you had a, like a present that you had put a massive value on, but you come to find that the value that you placed on that gift was a whole lot different than the value that they placed on that gift. Anybody ever been there? Like you worked hard for that gift. You spent time to go get it. I mean, you like had this whole plan, Amazon maybe, and you spent money, you spent time, and now that you've handed it to them, you have found that they don't value it or take care of it like you were hoping that they would. Anybody ever been there? How many of you like parents are like, amen, praise the Lord, I know what you're talking about. I have this issue with my children like this. My my two sons, Chandler and Malachi, they are now seven and five years old. There's some terrors, but I love them. But how many know as parents, you will buy them a brand new pair of shoes and you will tell them 
These are only church shoes. You don't walk outside with them. You don't play in them. You don't go to school in them. You only wear them to church. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And next thing you know, 24 hours later, those shoes look like they've been worn for 18 years. And I have found that my kids don't value the same thing that I value when I give them a gift, when I when I had put some time, I had worked hard for those pair of shoes. I worked hard for them toys, even though we throw a lot of them away. We are minimalist in some form or fashion. Thank God for my wife. God bless her. But we, we work hard for them, and then we come to find later that they don't value it the way that we value it. They've been super rough on things that I would have taken some time with. You know, at least give yourself a few weeks before you ruin those shoes. You see, the value that I had placed on them, that I, the things that I have bought versus the value that they place on it, or maybe even a gift that I've given to someone else, their value of it is completely different. And we see in the book of Joshua, in Joshua 17, an unfolding understanding of the concept of the inheritance of the people of God. Now, you see, the word inheritance is a word that we should all become familiar with throughout this passage and throughout this series and what I've learned is this, Christianity is not an invoice, it's an inheritance. But often it is presented as an invoice. It is what you must do and the price that you must pay in order to access all that God has. But I found as I study scripture, and I study the Bible, that this faith that I have and that I stand on, it's an inheritance. It is less of a requirement-based religion and more of a relationship-based religion. And everything that I need, everything that I want, everything that I desire and pray for, God has already provided it for me. But the issue is the ability to access what is already mine through Christ. And in this passage of Joshua 17, we are watching the various tribes of Jacob. They have now crossed over the Jordan and they have they have settled into this land and, and they fought some battles and now they're now settling into their inheritance and there is a progression of maturity that's taking place that creates the ability for them to handle this inheritance. Because here's something that I've learned. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. If you don't know how to handle your inheritance or use what you've been given, it would be better if you have not even received it. And so there is this process of learning how to handle their inheritance. And I'm setting you up today because we are watching the people of Joshua, the people of Joseph in Joshua 17, who are learning the difference between being slaves versus settlers, who are learning what to do with something that they've never had, which is a possession of their own. And this is something that I'm trying to get us to see is this. It is difficult to appreciate the value of what you're not fully invested in. I'm going to say it again. It's difficult to appreciate, to appreciate the value of what you're not fully invested in. And in this passage, we are watching the people of Joseph run up on Joshua talking about what you have given us is not enough. That we have become too numerous. There's too many of us for the space that you have assigned to us. And if you go back and you read Joshua 15 and 16, if you want something to go to sleep at night, just go read Joshua 15 and 16. You'll be bored reading it. And you'll find that when, as you read it, they, they are just allotting the different parcels of land and who is receiving what. And you see, it's hard for us to appreciate the value in that because we weren't invested in the battles. But for those of them who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, those who went from slaves to getting to where they are now, they had, they had done all that to get their own land. And when they read Joshua 15 and 16, they're like, that's my land. I had to endure for that. I had to fight for that. I shed blood, sweat, and tears to, to receive that. And the value of it, the reason why they value it is because they are invested in it. And so now we've reached Joshua 17, where we are seeing the end result of a large investment. And you see, when you only see the credits and you didn't watch the plot unfold, it's difficult to appreciate the product. 
That'd be like watching the, the, the credits of Grey's Anatomy and going to tell someone who's watched the 80,000th season of Grey's Anatomy saying, oh, it ain't that good. They being invested in the 87 seasons of Grey's Anatomy might be mad at you. Some of you, even during this pandemic and, and quarantine, maybe you've rewatched the whole, and there's a whole bunch, have you, how many of y'all watch Grey's Anatomy? Raise your hand if you watch Grey's Anatomy. How many you know it's, oh, it's getting crazy right now? I don't even watch it that much. But you see, it's hard to appreciate. If you only ever watch the credits and you never see the plot unfold, it's hard to appreciate the product. You see, I wonder what Joseph was thinking. Joseph has been dead now for many years, and now his descendants, the generations after him, are inheriting this land. And I want us to understand that Joseph spent time in prison so they can inherit this blessing. He had spent some time in Potiphar's house being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of rape. And he endured a scandal that was not the result of his actions, but yet he was running from it. And he, he had even been thrown in a pit by his brothers so that way these generations could receive and inherit this blessing. And Joseph had been through all that and now his descendants, the generations after him, have the audacity to roll up on Joshua and say, well, it's getting kind of crowded in here. And I wonder, I wonder how their complaints look to Joseph. Joseph like, you want to talk about crowded spaces. It was crowded in the pit when my brothers threw me in there and left me for dead. It was crowded in that jail cell when I was running for my life being falsely accused. It's, it, you, you want to talk about crowded. Now the one who brought about the blessing is now generations removed from the ones who would actually receive it. Kind of like many of us here today. We walk into this amazing church and we see this beautiful building. We see what God has done in this church over 33 years of an investment and building a legacy, and we see the, the, all the beautiful faces in this room, and we see what God has done, and, it, and we can walk in here, and we're sitting in this room today in an inheritance. We are sitting in a blessing. We are sitting in a legacy that someone before you fought for, that someone before you gave to, that someone before you prayed for and cried for, shed blood, sweat, and tears for, so that way we could be here today. So that way you could capture the extraordinary life that God has for you. So that way you can walk into a place where your marriage may be in shambles and you can find restoration. So that way your family who may be all dispersed could come together in one place in unity and worship the name that is above every name. We are sitting in an inheritance. So your faith could be restored. So that way the darkest moments of your life could be shared with the people that you love who have your back and who will walk this journey with you. Let us never take for granted those who've gone before us. Let us never look over the sacrifice that was given the people who have pioneered and have paid away so we can be sitting in this seat today looking at this beautiful church and all the different backgrounds and demographics and ethnicities and all levels of wealth in this room and we can worship the name of Jesus together, every color of skin. It's a beautiful thing. And let me say this, we are today with those before us invested in yesterday. Oh, that'll preach somebody. So why don't we just take a moment and show our appreciation to those who have given so much so we can be here today. Why don't we show some gratefulness and some gratitude to our pastors, to the faithful givers, to the committed volunteers, to the people that have prayed, to the people that have cried out to God, to the people who have served this church for over 30 years. We are sitting in an inheritance today. Let me just say this to all of those who fit in this category. Don't walk away or move on too soon and miss seeing and enjoying the fruit of your labor. And I say this today with full confidence and all humility. I am that fruit. To my 
children's ministry workers. God bless them. To the parks and the Wayne and Betty Youngs and all the other people, you know who you are. You're probably like having side effects from me and kids ministry. To my youth leaders, to my youth pastors, to my church family, to the mamas in church who slapped me around to keep me in line. It takes a village. I just wanna say from this generation, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your giving and the sowing into this house. I am up here today because of your faithfulness and your obedience. And I am one of many fruits of your works. So if you're here today and you're thinking, well, I'm just the old person. There's really no place for me anymore. We have this generational church and you know, they're using all these younger people. There's not really a place, let me tell you, that you are so far from the truth. And I stand here today on behalf of this entire younger generation, and I want to say to you confidently, we need you. We want you. That we would not be here if it weren't for you. And let me encourage you today to lean into your role this season of bringing wisdom, of bringing guidance. You may not have the drive like you used to have. But that's why he got us young people up in here who can run around and can do all the the hard work. But let me say this, we also don't have the experience, the wisdom, the guidance that you have. And even though maybe your leg of the race may be coming to an end, meaning you've ran your 100 meter dash, let me tell you, the ultimate race is not over. That we need you cheering us on. We need you pushing us harder. We need you needing you help us to reach more people so that way the generations after us and after them and after them will have a place to find God in their life. So let me flip the script to my fellow generation. What are we going to do? And I can stand here today actually knowing my investment that I've made as a teenager in this house and and being the younger generation at the same time, I can speak from both angles today. What are we going to do? Will we let what has been fought for, prayed for, sacrificed for end with us? Oh yeah, I'm I'm gonna step on some toes today of this generation because I are one. And I can do that. Or are we going to step up and continue to build what was built for us? That way way their ceiling could be our floor. We will not and cannot be a generation that allows the generation after us not know God. Like it happened in scripture. We will not. We cannot be a generation that walks around with, with this spirit of entitlement. No, 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 no. We can't do that. That's not how it works. We got to put our own part to play in this journey. I'm not talking about just in our church. I'm talking about in this world. We have our own part to play in our families. What your parents did back then was so that way their ceiling would be your floor. You don't have to start over. You just need to stand on where they ended and continue moving it forward. And I don't know who that is for today, but I want to encourage you to step into that role. We need you. So we see in Joshua Joshua chapter 17 where the people of Joseph did not appreciate the value of what they were given because they weren't the ones who fought in the battle. They weren't the ones who were invested to get where they were. And, And it made me think, I wonder what Jesus, I wonder what it looks like to Jesus with what he went through for us, the price that he paid, the invoice that he stamped, the settlement that he provided for us to be in right standing with God. I wonder what it looks to him when a lot of times we're over here complaining, telling him what he's given us is not good enough. It's hard to appreciate the value of what you're not invested in. But before we disparage the people of Joseph, they're coming to Joshua, asking them for more land. I want to be careful because they have grown since the last time that Moses assigned their borders. And now I understand the value of contentment. On one hand, I want to say that they should have been thankful and happy with going from slaves to settlers. They should have been happy with any amount that was given to them. And so there is a sense in which I think all of us in this room should be a little bit more content. No matter our battles, we have a lot to be thankful for. God has done a lot in our life. 
And Paul even said in, in, in Philippians 4 that I've learned the secret of being content in every circumstance. Whether I have a lot or I have a little, I've learned to be content. Yet the same guy who also said, talking about contentment, said, I also press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. And what I'm trying to figure out in this text and in my own life to discern the difference between contentment versus complacency. Because on one hand, I want to say, really? You're cramped? Really? Like your ancestors had to put up with Pharaoh's whip and you can't handle close quarters? Really? But on the other hand, I get it. Because when Moses a lot of their land to them, there was only 32,000 of them, and now there is 52,000 of them, and so they've outgrown the space that was assigned to them. They're having growing pains. And as their blessings were breaking out, their worlds were closing in. Here's something I want you to understand today. God will often use discomfort to grow you into your destiny. It's possible that the people of Joseph were not griping but that they were growing. And you see, they have come to a point, and maybe you're at this point in your life. Maybe this is why you're restless at night. Maybe this is why you're tossing and turning, and you sense that there's got to be something more and where you, than where you started is not where you want to stay. Because maybe, maybe perhaps you've outgrown yesterday's blessings. And we come to a point sometimes where, where what has been handed to us and handed down to us can't hold us anymore, and it's time to believe God for something more. In other words, we can't settle where we started, that we need God to use us more. We need God to speak to us in deeper ways. We can't live off the same five Bible verses from when we were 12. We need God to speak to us in hidden places. We need greater insight. We want a greater effectiveness. We need a greater sense of purpose. God is not intimidated by your requests for more. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. John 10, 10 tells us the thief, Satan has come to, to steal, to, to kill, to destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and that life more abundantly. Yeah. Another translation says, a life to the full. You want to know what capture extraordinary means? That. Let me tell you something. If God didn't want you to have more, he would have taken you home already. So they said to Joshua, what a lot of times we say to God, you should have given us more land. You should have given me more, God. But I want us to observe the text here today. They said, why have you only given us one allotment? That what you have allotted to me doesn't feel like a lot. I feel like I was meant for more. You see what I'm doing there? A lot meant. A lot meant. What I like that Joshua did here was that he didn't rebuke them for their ambition, but yet he reminds them of their possession. Joshua says, okay, okay, I, I, I see you want more. I see that you're asking me for, for more opportunities, and, and if, if you want more, and if you're so numerous, and you, you got your, your, the space that you're in is too small for you, and you're breaking out, and there's not enough room, you see, there's gonna come a time in your life where the relationships, the people that you're in a relationship with yesterday, will not, and the mentality that they represent, will not be an adequate supply or a support system for where God is trying to take you. Oh, come on, somebody. That'll preach. And you see, what's happening is, is you're growing into your inheritance, and you're outgrowing your past. And when you start outgrowing it, then you're going to have to shed some stuff. You've got to shed some ways of thinking. You're going to have to shed some people in your life. Paul says it very clearly in 1 Corinthians 13 that when I was a child, I spoke like a child, act like a child, reason like a child. But when I put, became a man, I put what? All that childish junk behind me. God wants to wake us up so we can realize that there are, there are some things that we are just too grown for. We're too grown to be bitter. We're too grown to be negative. We're too grown to be lazy. 
We're too grown to be cynical. We're too grown to be fearful. You are too grown to be living the life that you're living, struggling with all that stuff. You too grown. Turn to your neighbor and say, you too grown for that. You too grown for that. Tell them. Don't be ashamed of it because they're going to be mad at me, not you. Really, they'd be mad at you because you said it. You see, now what Joshua does is something very wise. It shows his experience. It shows his enlightenment. He points out the limiting factors in their situation. When the people approached Joshua, they were pointing out the Canaanites and the Raphites and they're larger in appearance and they have all this stuff, but they were, Joshua tells them, the Israelites were, were, were greater in power. What, what this is saying is some of the things in your life may be larger in appearance, but they are not greater than the power that is inside you because of Jesus Christ, that the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives on the inside of you, that the unlimited spirit of God lives on the inside. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm telling you today, but the unlimited, powerful spirit of God that rose Jesus from the grave lives on the inside of you. So whatever may seem dead in your life, you have the power to resurrect it through Jesus Christ. Somebody needs to get a little bit more proud of that this morning, a little bit more confidence, a little faith to rise within their spirit today that you have the power inside of you. It may be larger in appearance, but it is not greater in power. And now Joshua told them what to do, and their response was, there's Canaanites in the forest. We got a lot against us. And then Joshua reveals to them their limitation. He says, okay, if you're so numerous, hill country of Ephraim is too small for you. They don't want you to go up into the forest. And you see, sometimes we aren't able to see the full lot that's in front of us, and we've been missing the forest for the trees. That we've been missing the lot for the little. And a lot of times we assume that all there is to us is what we can see. And we limit ourselves based on what our parents accomplished. Like, but like I said a moment ago, what part of your parents accomplished was so that their ceiling could become your floor. Jesus even tells us that if I go to the Father, greater works will be done in you in my name, through you. So Joshua tells them, clear it, and its farthest limits will be yours. You see, there are two parts of your property. There's the part that you're living on and the part that it's wooded that you have not gone into because you're scared of what's in there. But you see, the moment that you become more convinced about what's in you rather than what's standing up against you, you will begin to push the limits of what's possible in your life. We often miss our destiny because we have a limited estimation of our own ability. Some of us here today, we're just going back and forth in life up and down our driveway, back and forth to work, back and forth from Sunday to Sunday, back and forth from habit to habit, back and forth, trying and doing, trying and doing. And Joshua told them, if you want to conquer new land, if you want to claim new territory, then it's time to break out the chainsaw, it's time to pick up the ax and go out into that forest and start clearing some trees. And what I'm trying to tell you today is it's going to require an investment for you to access everything that you've been given. It's already yours. It's just time to break out the chainsaw. It's time to grab the ax and it's start, start trying to clearing a new path. It's time to clear a new path. So let me tell you something. You have a whole lot more than what you're using. I want you to tell your neighbor right now, there's a whole lot more in you than you're currently using. Tell them, tell them confidently. No shame. Again, they're going to be mad at me for this. I take it. The truth is you're a whole lot smarter than you've been acting. Hmm? I see y'all social media sometime, I know that. Pop my collar on that one. You've got a whole lot more brain than you're using. Problem is, there's too much clutter. There's too much worry, there's too much anxiety, there's too much fear, it's cluttering your mind. Understand, it's not that they didn't have the land. It was because they couldn't see the potential of it because of what was in the way. It's not that you don't have it. It's just that right now you're in a clearing season. And I believe that God has sent me on an assignment today to issue you a clearing permit to whatever is keeping you from accessing every part of God's blessing that Christ died for to bring into your life. It's time to go into the forest. 
it's time. And I'm preaching at you today because I'm trying to get you excited about your inheritance. It is time to clear your land. And I know it doesn't seem like much, but why don't you ask that little boy who had five loaves and two fish that when he cleared a path and he brought it to Jesus, that it released the potential to feed over 5,000 men and women and their children. Ask that little old widow who only had a little bit of oil, but when she made some space and she grabbed some vessels, God worked a miracle through her and she lived off the rest of her life on what was left. And in this season as a church, it's time for us to clear our land, to step into our inheritance, to continue building a legacy that allows generations after us to experience Jesus greater than we ever did. I remember when I was a boy, I asked my dad, I love you, dad, I'm about to say this, but I asked my dad one time, why don't you have a six pack? I love you. So I'm helping you with your diet. He told me, he looked at me, I, I thought I was about to go meet Jesus when I asked that question. He looked at me and said, I do. It's just covered up. It's in the cooler. That's a Yeti cooler. But let me tell you something. You got it. It's just covered up. Then you got a whole lot more love for your wife. Oh, I'll get ready. But it's covered up with your selfishness. You've got a whole lot more opportunities in your career, but it's covered up with your insecurity. You've got a whole lot more love for your church, but it's covered up because you won't allow God to have control. You've got a whole lot more in your talents, but it's covered up by your fear. And Joshua tells us, if you can clear it, you can conquer it. But let me also say this. Don't be so quick to claim what you're unwilling to clear. Because the abundance of the blessing will correspond to the abundance of the burden. Scripture tells us to whom much is given, much is and you see your land is what God gives you but your life is what you build on it and all this time that we spend complaining about other people's lots all this time we spend judging other people's blessings all the time we've been doing all of that we could be clearing you see we don't need God to give us more land to claim we need to clear what God has already called us to conquer I don't, know, I don't know who this is for today, but some of you need to step into your inheritance. It's time to grow into your inheritance. And I know what you're fighting seems too big for you right now, but if you invest into the inheritance that God gave you, if you clear the land and you make a path, you begin uprooting stuff and tearing out things in your life that God did not attend for them for, for, to be there, and you start to take care of what God has given you, then you will begin to see your inheritance for what it really is. And you see, sometimes the reason we don't fight for it is because we don't value it. And the reason we don't value it is because we haven't cleared it. And since we haven't cleared it, we'd ha we haven't been able to see it for what it really is. And it's time to clear your land and challenge your limitations. Maybe the limit isn't what God didn't give you. Maybe the limit is what you're not using. And let me tell you, God, will, God won't call you to use what you don't have. He wants you to use what he's already put into your hand. God wants to do something through your life. He's put you in relationship with people in your workplace, in your family, to be the light of Jesus in that relationship. You may be the only Bible someone may ever read. So what legacy are you leaving behind for your children? What legacy are you leaving behind for the people that will come after you, for the friends, for the family? It's time for us to pick up the ax and go into the forest. God has given us everything we need. We just gotta go in there and put some work in it. We can have all the faith in the world for God to do all these things, but the Bible is very clear about faith without works is dead. We play a part in our own miracle.
look at any miracle throughout the scripture, there was a part that every single one of them played. There was a responsibility that every one of them had to do something in order to get that miracle. The woman with the issue of blood, you say, oh, well, she just touched his garment. Yeah, she had the faith to step forward, to take the step, to risk it all in the fear, in the insecurity, in the overwhelmingness, in the anxiety, and all the depression, facing 12 years of bleeding and not being able to find any cure, spending everything she had. All she had to do was take a step and touch the garment, and she played a part in her own miracle. And he said, because of your faith, you have been healed. <laughs> Ask the centurion who came. He said, he said, one of my men is sick. And he said, well, take me to him. He said, you don't even have to go, Jesus. You just say the word. But he had to take a step of faith to say, all you have to do is speak it, and it will happen. And guess what? That, 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 that servant was healed. His worker was healed by the power of the word of Jesus. There's a part that everyone played, even bringing Lazarus back to life. He had to tell Lazarus to get up and come out. And some of you, God is calling out to you today and said, what seems dead? He is saying, come on out. Come on out. Come on out, I'm not done with you. I'm not through with you. I know your life seems like it's dead and gone. I know your marriage seems like it's dead and gone. I know those kids that have walked away from Christ seem like they're dead and gone, but I'm gonna call it out like Lazarus, and I'm gonna say, come forth. It's time to come out. It's time to take off those old rags. It's time to take off that past. It's time to take off everything that's been in your life and to step into the new life that Jesus has for you. You see, the greatest gift that God has ever given us it's the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. You see, God sent his one and only son named Jesus to die on a cross for your and my sins, to give us life and life to the full. And the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God rose him from the grave, that he raised him from the dead, it says that you will be saved. For some of you today, today is that day to hand your life over to Jesus, the greatest gift of salvation that you could ever receive. He's already given it to you. It's just time for you to take hold of it. With every eye closed in this room, every head bowed, for some of you, it's time to allow God to come in and invade the things in your life that only he can restore. That you can try to do everything else in the world, you can try to fill those pockets, but it's like filling your pockets with holes in it. He's the only one who can fulfill your marriage, who's the only one who can fulfill your life. And I want to encourage you today to allow God to reveal to you his purpose for your life. And it's time to allow the King of kings, the Lord of lords, to set you free today. And if you're in this room or you're watching online today and you want to make that decision to receive the free gift of salvation in Jesus, whether it may be for the very first time or maybe it's a recommitment today, then we're going to pray a prayer together as a church family and I want all of us in this room to pray this prayer together and if that's you and you want to accept him today I want you to pray this prayer and believe it in your heart with everything in you but before that we pray this prayer I want to give you a chance so I know who I'm praying with today with every eye closed every head bowed if that's you I'm going to count to three and I just want you to slip up your hand today so I know who I'm praying with and praying for nobody's going to bombard you nobody's going to talk too much we're going to just ask you to raise your hand and then we have something we want to give you after service but we just want to know who we're praying for today if that's you, when I count to three, I want you to slip up your hand. One, two, three. Lift them up, lift them up, lift them up. I see it, I see it, I see it, I see it. Thank you, Jesus. Lift up those hands, lift up those hands. I see you, I see you. Come on, I see you. I see you, I see you. Come on, hands up all across this room. Come on, church, let's celebrate. Let's make some noise. There is new life, new beginning. There is salvation in Christ being found today. All right, let's pray this prayer. You can put your hands down. Let's pray this prayer together, and they're gonna give you some instructions on what to do. Let's all say it out loud where our ears can hear ourselves. If you're online, I want you to say it in your home. Say, dear Jesus, come into my life. Help me to live a new life in you. God, I accept you as Lord and leader of my life. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for me. And today I ask that you would forgive me of all my sin and help me to live a new life in you. Today, I put my faith in you. I put my trust in you, and I put my hope in you. Make me a new creation. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said a big amen. Come on, church, why don't we celebrate one more time? Make some noise.